subscribe button, <coughs> smash that like button, hit the bell. Like and subscribe, everyone, or I'm giving, I'm failing you all. Okay, so today we're really getting into the meat of calculus. This should sort of start being new stuff. Maybe not for all of you, but today we're going to discuss tangent lines. Okay, so some of you have seen tangent lines in high school. Can anyone give me like an operative or provisional definition of a tangent line? Or tell me why they're important? Yes, sir. That's a perfect definition then. So why do we care about the instantaneous rate of change? These are all very valid and correct definitions, but what's the intuition about it? Why do we care about rates of change? Anything. You're getting close. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the point. Close enough. Okay. So uh, why do we need tangent lines? Well, here's the motivation. So firstly, and this, this is not a comprehensive list of uh, applications, um, we need a way to express that this line increases more slowly than, um, say, this curve. Okay. How do we know um, when does one line grow faster than another line? Well, there's two quantities that define a line. What are they? Hmm? Uh, you need two things to define a line. Rise in the run defines the slope. Perk up, people. This is high school. Yeah. I'm going to say point and slope. The y-intercept is what they want you to do in high school, but that's actually my least favorite of all of the line equations. The one I like most is uh, slope point. You give me a point and you tell me the slope, and I just find the second point by saying I go up this much and write this much. So, um, otherwise, we'll all be finding y-intercepts of stuff. But that's that's good. Okay, so one of those things is the slope, right? What does it mean when one one line has a greater slope than another line? Increasing at a faster rate. Yeah. I'm trying to get you, like, when is it harder to walk uphill? It's more steep. When it's more steep, right? So steepness, mathematically, is called slope. Okay, so we need to codify some way of saying that this curve is more steep than this curve. Right? I'd rather walk up this guy than walk up this guy. Right? So that's the geometry in English, but as I'm saying, we always need an algebraic codification, so that's what we're going to strive for today. That's just the one. Uh, the second guy is uh, all functions. look like lines when looked at closely. And this is a really badly, this is not really that mathematical. But what I mean to say is that if you take a curve like this and say this is the, uh, I have A over B here and I'm looking at this line. If I extend it, make this A over B, that this function looks like a line, right? So when you look at this guy really close and you like sort of blow it up, it looks like this. And it turns out the line that the function looks like when you look at it really closely is, is the tangent line. You should have discovered this a little bit when working with those signs on small values, right? You discovered that sine of a tiny number is equal to that tiny number. So these are just a couple motivations. Okay. So to begin, we need a definition. Secant. This one's not too bad. So I'll just draw a picture first. So here is a curve. I'm going to define two points on this curve. Let's call the first one P. Let's call the other one Q. And I'm going to connect those. So the line, do you guys, are you guys familiar with this notation? The line connecting P and Q. Well, suffice it to say, this is notation for the line connecting P and Q. The line PQ, uh, maybe I'll just write it, i.e. the line connecting P with Q. 
uh, with, so this has to be named f of x with p and q on the graph of f is called the secant. And I'm going to say at p, but we could have done it at q. OK, what's the, what's the equation for this line? Why are we stuck? OK. What if I say that this is x0? And maybe we could call this one x1. Sorry, we're looking for the equation of the point slope formula. Is that what you're? Line. Give me an equation for a line. That's, that's one type of equation for a line. OK, so would that be correct? That would be correct, yeah. yeah. OK, so um, that's correct. So I'm going to write the, uh, since I have two points, the most appropriate equation here to use is the two-point equation for the line. Again, like finding y-intercepts is not really that useful. What I care mostly about a line is, is one point on it and its slope. Right, so in high school, they say y-intercept just so it's easier to mark, because that's a standard line, basically. Right, so I'm just going to take this p and q. So this p here is actually the point what? x naught f of x0, and this point q here is x1, f of x1, yeah? So the line is going to be given by what? y minus y, let's choose this one to be the point that we're going to use, y0, is equal to, oops, I should, well, maybe that will simplify it a bit. Let me just call this y0 then, and x1, y1. Okay, so this is going to be, so how do I get the slope of this line then? Yes, sir? Change of y over change of x. Yeah, what is the change in y? It's uh, y, 1 minus y, naught, over x, 1 minus x, naught. x minus x, naught. OK, I'm a little bit concerned. Was this difficult because there's no numbers? Is that the issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's three, there's, we, we covered this in the first class. So you, you guys are probably used to this one, right? Yes. Yeah, but like that means you have to always find this point. That, that's extra work. If I give you, all you need to form a line is two points, right? Or a point and a slope. So when I'm drawing, when I draw a line, uh, so suppose you tell me you want a line that goes through 3, 7 and has slope 3, over 4, this is how I draw the line. I find 3, 7, then I go, uh, that's rise over run, right? So every time I move forward 1, 2, 3, 4, I go up 1, 2, 3. Right? Then I don't have to futz around trying to find the y intercept. <coughs> right? So I, that's actually the worst out of all of them, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why they taught it to you in high school. They have this tendency of picking the worst out of all of them. But uh, all it's required of you would be to move this around, right? To get the y equals mx plus b, right? So this is very clear, right? You have the point. If I put x not y not into here, you get 0, 0, right? And if I put x1, y1 into here, you also get 0. Uh, no, that won't give you 0, 0, but that will give you the slope, right? So again, this is just slope is here. And then the y-intercept is going to be everything else. But this is the one I prefer. Yes, sir? Why do you need that bracket on the side? What is that? Like the x minus x, not y minus y. You just, that's, this is the point. This is, that's the equation of a line. What do you mean, why do I need it? I need it because I need it. That's the equation of a line. What's the first, L, L multiplied? Well, no, this is not, sorry. L, a line, is this equation. I didn't use an equal because then I'd have like two equals. Yeah, you can't think a line is exactly that equation. It's not. Because right, uh, some of you will have to take linear algebra and you'll find that it's. Okay, well, that part signifies the slope. What is that part? This is the slope. That's the slope. What's that part? So, well, this point? is basically like the left right shift, right? Oh. And then this is the up down shift. 
right? Oh, so it's like I've moved the y-intercept, okay. right? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not fully understanding. So we would find, like, in order to solve this, are you saying that we would just? There's nothing to solve. That's the equation of the line. We're solving nothing, right? I'm saying, here's a picture. Yeah. This is an arbitrary function f. Right, there are two points that go through it. And this is the equation of that line. Right, so you inputted the equation for slope into where the m would be. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Well, this is slope. I'll right, give you that, right. yeah. So, OK, yeah, so you answered my question. What does the uh, y minus y not represent? That's, that's the up and down shift. So, so the y is, is like this what you were saying there. OK, suffice it to say there are three equations for a line. All of them are equivalent, right? So th this shouldn't bother us too much. Right? I can give you a bunch of equivalent forms of a circle, a parabola. But um, again, so this is what I'm going to use as a line, right? All it is is just a rule. It says I have a, if you give me an x value, I'll give you back a y. Right? And if you graph it, you'll get a line. You can also expand. OK, let's expand this. So if I expand this, you get. Um, y is equal to, and this let me call this the slope, you get mx minus mx naught plus y naught. And I guess th this is the term that you're used to being the y-intercept. But that, to me, that's not very useful information. OK, so let's continue. Um, go back to your pre-calc and look at those lines. But this is good. If we didn't sort that out, nothing else from this lecture would have made any sense, because we're, we're only talking about lines today. OK, so you believe me, at least, that that's the equation for the line. You can reorganize it if you would like, but I'm going to leave it like that. So what I want to do is I want to somehow move this point Q closer to P. And I want to move it closer to P and look at the lines that are going through it. And once Q moves arbitrarily close to P, what you're going to find is you're going to get that line. And that line is going to define the tangent line. So algebraically, we have this. So again, I was going to write it again. Y minus Y naught is equal to, well, let me say this then. M x minus x naught. Oh, but m has a bunch of stuff in it. So this is the uh, equation of the secant line. I'm going to use this m. Maybe that'll make you more comfortable. So this is the slope of the secant, uh, where, and this let me say, m is equal to y1 minus y naught over x1 minus x naught, which I guess is you're used to this change in y over change in x. OK, so again, here's the equation of that secant line. Uh, so what do I want to do? Uh, I want to, whoops. I want to move p into q somehow. OK, so I'm going to use then this x0 and x1. So how can I write everything in terms of just x0 and x1? Well, uh, I'm going to replace these y's with function applications. So we have uh, L, the line, is y minus f of x0 is equal to f of x1 minus f of x0 over x1 minus x0 times x minus x0. So point slope equation of the line. So how can I move? Uh, so we want to move p into q, which is equivalent to moving uh, x1 into x0. Okay? So what tool do we have now which allows us to move things into other things? One may, one may say that we're limiting one thing into another thing. So what tool do we have to take limits? We have limits <laughs> to move things into other things. So is, do, does anyone have any idea how we can move x1 into x0, one point into another? We can make it like as x is approaching that specific x value, like as the second point is approaching the first point. Yeah, that's what I want to try to write. I want to try to write something like this, 
limit of x1 goes into x0, but I want to use numbers right, instead. So look at this. What happens if I let uh, x1 is equal to x0 plus h? Right? Then I can let h go to 0. So do you see if I set this up and set h goes to 0, that what I'm actually doing is moving x1 into x0? Yeah? As h approaches 0, these two things will become equal. So I'm going to modify this plot up here a bit. So the new situation we have, so I'm going to erase all of these labels. You may want to draw a new guy. OK, so here's the new situation. I'm going to give you a, a, a point x0. I'm going to say that uh, this point here is x0 plus h, right? so that this is separated by h. So what does that mean this is going to be? This means that this is going to be f of x0 plus h minus f of x0. So what's the slope of this line if I set it up like this? Well, it's going to be this rise over h, which is the run. Right? So that, the limit, OK? So to obtain the slope of the tangent, we need its slope, which we'll call m. Uh, which is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of the rise over run, right? f of x1 minus f of x0. Whoops, wrong labels. f of x0 plus h minus f of x0 over h. OK, so we need to stare at this a bit. So do you see how this is generating the slope of this line? Right, so I'm saying, give me the slope of this line, the slope of this line, and this line, and this line, and this line, and keep limiting that. Right? So the limiting behavior of the slopes is going to give me the limit, uh, is going to give me the slope of that tangent line. So this is basically what I'm trying to say here. Right? The limit of rise over run at x0, and I'm making the run arbitrarily small. Right? So that should push all the lines down. So does that make any sense? Because this is important. Like everything else is consequent from the, from the notions of tangents. So it's really important that we get these fundamentals correct. So why don't you uh, stare at this a bit and see if you can come up with any questions? Where? F of h. What would f of h over h be? Well, h is a distance. So what f, f of h is a height. That's not a slope. That's just a fraction. You need to connect two points to have a slope. And the nice thing about the limit is that these two points are never going to collide. So you always have two points to form a line. It's just that they're getting arbitrarily close. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't really need any of these limits to, do the, to resolve these questions. OK, then. So th now then, we have a definition of a tangent line. So if we have, uh, let PQ denote the secant. Through P and Q, which are on the graph of some function f. Then the limit of the secants as you move q into p is equal to the tangent at p. <coughs> Did you guys see a little bit? Of, some of you should have seen some tangents in high school, yeah? Some of you already know how to take derivatives. Yeah? 
I don't know how much the system has changed, but I, I learned uh, derivatives in high school. OK, so what this behavior sort of looks like, let's do a, uh, a drawing here, the limiting behavior. So if I have a function like this, and suppose I want to find the tangent point here. So how you see that is basically, well, you want to connect those two things. Right, so you have a line like this. It's going to get a little bit messy. You have that line. And then you want to take something closer, you have that line. Then you want to take something closer and closer until eventually you find this line. I told you it would be messy, which is uh, considered the tangent. This should only touch the curve exactly once, very close to here. It doesn't matter if this goes up and, and, and crosses. Tomorrow I'll give you some physical ways of interpreting the tangent using velocity and acceleration in some physics. For now, we sort of have to focus on the theory of it. OK, so let's do an example. Maybe that will clarify things. Or maybe I should define derivative first. Let's define derivative first. A couple more definitions, then I'll do some examples. Definition. Derivative. So what's the derivative? For those of you who may have learned this before. Yeah, that's right. So if I give you a function f at x, its derivative at x is the thing telling you what the slope of the tangent is. It's another function which is, which is very useful to say. Um, it's going to help us very quickly form these tangent lines. So the derivative, let's write that. So I'm going to do a lot of definitions, then we'll do a lot of examples. Right? Uh, the derivative. of f at x in the domain of f is denoted uh, f prime of x. And it is equal to, so this is this new equal. I've shown you this before, yeah? No? Um, this basically just means I'm, I'm defining something. Right, it's equal because I'm saying so. Right, sometimes we need to prove things are equal. You'll never be able to prove this is equal because it's equal by definition. You don't have to worry too much about these if you, if you don't want. But uh, it's, it's, when we say something's equal in a definition, that's a little bit different than saying if it's equal generally. So I'm just going to put down this definition of the slope. Okay. So we're saying. The derivative of a function at x is equal to the limit of h goes to 0 of this quantity, which is the slope at that point. Right? So basically, this right, is, uh, you could interpret as being the slope of the tangent line. Right? So this, strictly speaking, is all geometric considerations of the tangent line. And we're going to have to sort of convert this to algebra in a bit. But uh, when we, we may ask you, and by may, I mean we are going to ask you, Find the limit or find the derivative of the following function using the definition, right? Because many of you would be able to tell me what the derivative of this is. What is it? 2x, right? You know that you take the exponent down, you multiply the coefficient, and you remove one. That's good to know because you know what the solution should be. But if we say find the derivative by first principles or using definition, you have to do it with the limits, otherwise we won't give you any of the marks. So just be very careful with that on your midterm, because I'm 100% positive that there is a question where we're asking you to compute the derivative uh, using first principles, mainly because I wrote it, or partially. Partially wrote it. OK. So I finally have an example. So let's consider. Uh, what is the slope? Of the tangent at, uh, let's say, geez, well, I want to say uh, a in the domain of f with a greater than 0. But you could just, in your head, think of it as 2. OK, so what is the slope of the tangent? at a in the domain of f with a greater than 0 when f of x is equal to 1 over x. Right? So that's the plot, at least on the positive end, 
That's the plot that looks like this. It goes through 1, 1, right? And it's uh, even or odd, so there should be something down here. So what is the slope of the tangent at that, uh, not at this point, but at, a, at an arbitrary point A? Right, so I'm, I need to find out what that tangent line is. So first, I want you to think about how you can rephrase this question using this definition. So I'm going to wipe down the board. And then you're going to tell me how to rephrase the question into an easier one. I'm also going to check if it's so far. Okay, anyone have a restating of the question that may be a little bit easier than the one that I asked? Yes, sir? On the derivative as x up, which is 1, 1? That's close. Like, the, we can't approach points. We can only approach numbers. That's why I had to convert the point to a number. Okay, you're going to be asked to do this next week. So, yeah. Well, what would you do if I, if I gave you this on a midterm? Um, what would you do? Well, my first step would be to work out the definition of the derivative. That is perfect. OK, so what would the rest, what are you basically, what am I asking you to find, really? You're asking me to find the slope. Yeah, but how do you calculate it? Well, you would take the point given. Yeah. And you would take the function. Yeah. Use this. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So you, you basically just need to use, you want this for this question. Exactly. So what we would do is we take that f of x. So how do I fill this out then? So this is, so what we really want, so equivalently, uh, find f prime and a, right, for uh, f of x is 1 over x. I just want to sort of tell you that sometimes we'll ask you something geometric, but what we're actually asking you to do algebraically is quite just use apply the uh, definition. So let's do this. So I want to do limit h goes, oh. so in this case, uh, f prime at a is equal to the limit as h goes to 0. And then we just got to plug into the, that uh, equation up there. So f of x plus h, in this case, is going to be 1 over, what's our x in this case? A. Uh, a plus h, right? This is the f of x plus h. Then we have to subtract minus f of a, which is 1 over a. And then we have to divide by h. OK, so now what uh, comes after this is just basic uh, limit calculation. So uh, we'll try to put in 0. And some bad stuff happens, right? Because we're dividing by 0 here, and we're not allowed to. So we're going to have to at least reorganize things a bit. So what we get here is the limit of h goes to 0 of 1 over h. That's this guy. And then I'm going to combine these fractions. So there's going to be an a here, and then a minus a plus h on the other side. And then that's all going to be over the common denominator a plus h a. And do we get any simplifications from this limit? h goes to 0. Uh, so what do we get? We get an a minus a. So that's gone. You get a minus h. On the bottom, what do you get? You get, well, did I screw up a sign? This is going to be, There should be some cancellation here. Have I made a mistake? No, I think that should be fine. No, no, this should be fine still. OK, so we have a minus a. That's 0. That's minus h. On the bottom here, we have 
and h. And then what's left is the 1 over uh, a squared plus ha. OK? So what do we get when we take h to 0 here? Does, does the limit exist? Let's just try plugging in some numbers. So here I get what? Minus 1. Uh, and then over on the other side, I'm going to get 1 over a squared plus ha. If I, make, if I take h to 0, this will become 0. So I'm left with minus 1 over a squared. So what have I just found? So I found this value, which happens to be equal to f prime of a, the derivative. And the derivative is equal to the slope of this function at x equals a. Okay? So even if you didn't really understand any of the definitions that I laid out today, if we ever ask you to find the tangent, or the slope of the tangent, or the derivative, all you have to do is apply this formula. If you don't want to think, just make sure you know how to take derivatives and memorize that. Right? But um, it should be easy to reconstruct that just by knowing what we were trying to do. So is there any questions regarding that example? Should be OK? Okay, uh, there's just one piece of terminology you need to know for your web work or weeby work. What is it? Is it weeby work or is it web work? You call it web work? Why did they capitalize the B? They want me to call it weeby work. Otherwise, they should change it. Okay, so you need to know what a normal is. So the normal to f of x at x equals p is the line perpendicular to the tangent. I'm just telling you this because the web work sometimes asks you questions about normals. That's not too bad, right? Because if you have a slope, if you have a curve that looks like this, and you have a tangent that goes like this, then the slope, ah, the normal, should be the line that's perpendicular to that. So here's a question, a fun one, maybe. Let's call this an exercise. So uh, given f of x, what is the equation for its normal? Uh, maybe I should specify a point. What's the equation for its normal at, let's say, x equals a? So what two things then do we need to form the line? So we know we need the slope and a point, right? Uh, all the things are basically equivalent. So, OK, so I'm going to write the, uh, so the equation for the tangent, I can write like this now. OK, y minus. That's y naught is equal to the slope. Sorry, I should be using a. Which is equal to the slope of the tangent at that point minus this. And this is why I prefer this line to the other one. Otherwise, I'd have to go through a lot of work trying to calculate the y-intercept. Right? But this is very easy to see that uh, the, the point a f of a lies on this line. Because right? you put a in here and you put f of a in there, you get zeros everywhere. OK, so given that this is the equation for the tangent line, what is the equation for the normal? 
right? So I'm saying that the normal is just the line that's perpendicular to that line. Yeah. So remember, if I have a line and its slope is m, what is the slope of the line that is perpendicular to it? Negative. The negative reciprocal of that line. So for the so this is the equation of the tangent. The equation for the normal then, okay, it's a line that goes through the same point. We want the line to go through a f of a, and its slope has to be the negative reciprocal. of the slope of the tangent at that point. All right, so if you can just understand that these derivatives are giving you slopes of tangents, you should be off to the races. I know maybe some of the geometric formulation wasn't uh, maybe to your liking, but you, all you need to basically, you should be able to draw a tangent line. You need to know that it's a line that strikes the curve exactly once. You should have a notion of what it means to be tangential. What do we got next? Okay, so why don't you tell me what the uh, what is the normal? What is the normal line on f of x equal one over x at x equals a for a greater than zero? Try to write down the equation for the line of the normal. Uh, and recall that we've already calculated what the tangent slope is. So I'm going to come back to that after erasing the board. We have an answer. OK, so let's try to, again, to use the um, point slope formula. So I need one point on the line. Can you give me one point on the line? Yes, sir. Is it y minus f at a equals 1 over f prime at a bracket 1 over x minus a? Yes, but not one over x. This? The because the function is equal to one over x. Oh yeah, but you, no. you so you need. I'm saying it's the derivative of that. Okay. Right. So what is the derivative of one over x at a? It just be a squared divided. Well, we calculated it. That's right. It was, um, oh, it was somewhere. It was minus one over a squared. Yeah. So again. Maybe I should go on to our explicit here. We have a point, and our point here is a, uh, 1 over a. Right? That's a point on this graph. The slope is going to be the negative reciprocal of the derivative, which is minus 1 over minus 1 over a squared, which is a squared. Right? So the normal here should be the line y minus that, 1 over a, is equal to the slope, a squared, x minus a. Right? So yeah, this is why I like the point slope one the best. Because right? you find we're going to be working with points and slopes when we're doing calculus, not y-intercepts. So on the test, we could leave it like that. Huh? That would be our final answer. A line is a line, right? Mm -hmm. So a line is not something that's y equals mx plus b. That's one way of expressing the line. Uh, as long as the equation is defining, any equation has a strict definition of what graph it's making. So if you write down an equation and its graph gives you the line, it's a line. There are a bunch of other ways of describing lines, right? I can say, here's a plane, and then I want you to like intersect it with another plane, and then the intersection will give you a line. So there's a ton of different ways of, of talking about lines. They're quite important. There's a whole, do you guys have to take linear algebra? Some of you may be, but there's a whole discipline in studying lines in math. It's pretty important. OK, so we've talked a lot about algebra. So now we have to tie this back to the 
Uh, we, sorry, we talked a lot about geometry. Now we have to pull it back to algebra. All right, so we basically want to be able to say the derivative of this is equal to 2x without having to go through a limit calculation every time. That gets fairly, fairly messy. So uh, we call the calculation the calculation of, of a function's derivative. is called differentiation. I'm not very good with English, but this is like the active is a verb. Is a verb an action? Pretty sure a verb's an action. So this, this is the action of taking a der something's derivative. It's called differentiation. So I'm going to give you something called the differential operator. This may be weird, but this is just a technical way for us to tie the geometry of tangents to the algebra of tangents. So we have a funny function. So you guys remember we were talking about mappings, right? In the very first class, we had functions that could map things from sets A to sets B. Uh, I'm going to do something that you may have not seen, but should be sort of obvious that we can do it. Uh, this, the differential operator, is a mapping. And this mapping takes functions to other functions. And the precise nature of the mapping is that it takes f and it maps f to its derivative. Okay, So what have I done here? I said, well, I now have a function, right? something that I can use algebraically, which is taking me from f to f prime. But we have to remember that f prime has actually been given sort of geometrically. Right? That I'm saying this is going to be the process of taking the limit of these tangent lines. So we can say, like this will enable us to say things very quickly. For example, now I can just go ahead and say the derivative with respect to x of 1 over x is equal to minus 1 over x squared. Right? Instead of having to go through all the rigmarole of calculating limits. OK, so here's an exercise. Uh, let f of x equal 1 minus the absolute value of x. Uh, what is the what is the derivative of this function at 0? Give that some thought. OK, what do you guys reckon? Anyone? <clears throat> OK, so let, let's imagine what we're trying to do here. So remember, we're, taking a deri uh, we're, we're trying to find tangents to this point here. And the tangent is just the result of a limiting, uh, I think there's someone behind this wall. It's just the, the process of a limiting uh, <coughs> behavior. Okay, so. If I, it's sort of more easy to explain. Right, so I'm basically just saying what's the tangent here and then what's the tangent here. Okay. What is the, okay, so I want to calculate the tangent here. This has to be the limit of some secant computations. So if I connect this point with this point, what line do you get? You get this line, right? Is that true? <coughs> if I move closer, what line do I get? And closer? And closer. OK. So it's clear that the limit 
limiting behavior of the secants from the left-hand side is giving me this, this, it's reporting this as the tangent, yeah? Okay, now let's do the opposite approach. What is, so we need to find the tangent now from this side. Uh, that means I have to find the limiting behavior of the secants through these two points. So what line do I get? This one, yeah? I move closer, what line do I get? And closer? And then I eventually move on top, and I get this line. Okay, so what's the problem? Pardon me? Two different lines. So what do I have to conclude? Is there two different cases? Well, what does it mean when the limit has different, different answers on both sides? It's undefined. Okay? This has no derivative at that point. Because geometrically, we define the tangent to be the limiting behavior. We defined it to be something geometric. And since we use limits, limits already have to have the left limit and right limit being equal. Right? So, Let's work it out geometrically, just so I can prove to you it's not going to work. So you want to do the left one or you want to do the right one? I'm going to make you guys do the other one. Uh, what did I write here? Left. OK. So note. So let's just try to do this. Oh, sorry. Ugh. OK, let's try to do this using the definitions. OK, so we have f of x is equal to 1 minus absolute value of x. So I want to find f prime uh, at, what did I say, 0? So this means we have to find the limit of h goes to 0, and I'm going to say from the left, of uh, f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 over h. This 0 is the point that we're working at. It's different than this 0, which is a 0 that h is approaching. This is equal to the limit of h goes to 0 from the left. Of, and now let's put in the values. This one you get 1 minus 0 plus h. And then here you get 1 minus 0. This is all going to be over h. Let's continue simplifying. So limit of h goes to 0 from the left. OK. So this one's easy to resolve. The absolute value of 0 is 0. So I got, what I got left here is a 1, or more specifically, a minus 1. The bottom's easy to resolve. That's h. Uh, this 1, nothing's going to happen to it. But we have to ask ourselves, what should I be replacing 0 plus h with? Pardon me? That is correct. Uh, can you explain why you said minus h, not h? We're taking zero from the negative side, so we're taking the negative Yeah. So note, OK, we're taking h to 0 from the left. OK, so if I look at a number line, and here's 0, h is here. h is approaching like this. Therefore, if we're approaching from the left-hand side of 0, we know that all the values that h is going to obtain will be negative in all cases. Right, so I know that 0 plus h well, that's equal to h, which is equal to minus h in this case, because we know h is less than 0, because we're approaching 0 from the left. OK, so be careful with these absolute values. The, the signs always make a big difference. So I'm going to replace this 0 plus h with a minus h. So that's minus, minus h. Well, what do I got left? I got limit h goes to 0 from the left of 1 minus 1. Minus minus h is 1 divided by h is 1. Um, so we get the limit. Oh, I shouldn't have written limit. We just get that this is equal to 1. OK, so imagine then, OK, do you guys write this down? Can I just, I'm going to over, I'm going to write over this. Uh, I'm going to change this to a plus. All right, so nothing changes here, nothing will change here. If I make this a plus, then we have to revisit what we were thinking here, which means h is approaching 0 from the right, which means this condition now is this, which means this should be replaced with a plus. OK, so that would change that here. And then you would get 1 minus 1 over minus h over h. So from the other side, you get minus 1. Now let's ask ourselves, does, did what we calculate here 
coincide with what we were expecting to find? What are the slopes of those lines on either end? 1 and minus 1. What did we find? Well, the slope from the right-hand side should be negative. Did we find that? Yes. The slope from the left-hand side should be positive. Did we find that? Yes. So it's always good to try and confirm that your intuitions are matching up with uh, your algebra. Otherwise, you should check to see if you've made any mistakes. Yes, sir? Well, like if we're taking any other point, one, one line will be going from the left, one will be going from the right. What does that mean? One of the slopes have to be negative and the other has to be positive? No, that's not necessarily true. Um, like in this one. <coughs> okay? So if I'm connecting these two points, that's everywhere positive slopes. If I connect something down here, still positive. That's a very special example. Right? Other cases are where you do this. You may know those as critical points. But there we don't have two different slopes. We have zero behavior. So the thing that, um, so this is the next question I'm going to ask. What other types of things aren't differentiable given our definition geometrically? Right? Pardon me? Oh, well, that, that's easy, right? If the function's not defined, then you certainly can't get its derivative. Um, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll write more. But uh, yeah, the absolute value function has this corner. And the, that, that corner is the thing that is, that is basically screwing things up. That's the other reason we use derivatives, right? Derivatives and tangents actually tell us about how much something, if like I said, how curved is this, right? Is this more or less curved than this? Right, so all of you probably would be able to indicate to me that this is more curved than this. But uh, the only way we'd be able to sort of demonstrate that is by talking about the behavior of the individual slopes. Right, the, the change in tangent behavior here is a lot less severe than the changes you would get here. Right, so the whole point of calculus really is to use these tangents to communicate things about rate of change. Right, this is why the economist, this is why this is very useful in finance. Um, we're going to need the tangent to find points like this and points like this, which correspond to minima and maxima. Right, so this is going to be a very crucial piece of uh, technology that we're going to be using to find stuff. You guys know of data science and stuff like that? Ever heard of artificial intelligence? This is the starting point of artificial intelligence. Right? The people who are doing artificial intelligence are basically just making like coming up with fancy ways to find these. Uh, OK, so I'll tell you why. You don't have to know this, but it's extremely interesting in my assessment. So later on in the course, we're going to teach you how to do optimization. Okay. So suppose that this was some type of function. Um, you guys do business, supply demand type of stuff? Well, suppose you want to know what this point is. Suppose this is some type of physical. Uh, like maybe square footage and cost of house, right? So you want to find this minimum point. What happens if I put a ball here? What will happen? Yeah, the ball is going to do this. It's going to go bloop, 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 and it's going to settle down in the middle here, okay? And you'll find this. This is how you model like that description. So suppose you put a ball here. I want to know if it's going to go left or right. Well, I look here, I find that the slope is negative and conclude that it's going to go right. So I move, so maybe I, I guess that the smallest point is here. It says, sorry, your slope is negative, move right. Okay, so maybe I move right to here. It says, sorry, your slope is uh, positive, you should move left. So I move here, it says it's right. Uh, this is slope is negative, you should move right. Positive, you should move left. And you continue and eventually you find this point. This is a technique called gradient descent. You can extend it to all dimensions, right? So you can even look at surfaces if you want. And these surfaces may have, like, oh, geez. Let's not do symmetrical stuff like that. Uh, OK. So like, you can imagine this is like a contour mapping. And there's like a lake in there. This technique is also going to work in this situation, except you have to extend the definition of a tangent to multiple dimensions. You guys won't have to do that. But that's what the people in vector calculus will be doing, right? But this is powering all your artificial intelligence that's blowing up today. It's actually not that complicated to understand the fundamentals of what they're doing. But I would recommend that you try and find out because it's pretty fascinating. OK, so we just discovered that, the, that that example has no derivative at 0 because it has two tangents, uh, tangents at that point, which is illegal. I'm just going to use this word again. 
now I want to discuss other ideas. So what other situations will we find that the derivative doesn't exist? There's a hole. In my bucket. But yes, there's a hole. OK. Places where derivative doesn't exist. Derivative slash tangent doesn't exist. OK, so for sure if I do something like this, why would you say the derivative here doesn't exist? Yeah, you get, well, yeah, the, the limit doesn't exist. Even though the left-hand limit, you clearly get a tangent like this from the one side and a tangent like this from the other, but they're not the same line. It has to be the same line. So there's, uh, I think this was called the jump discontinuity. No, 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 this is just called the jump. Okay, so there's no derivative at jumps. Uh, another easy one would be this. This is removable. Singularity. So this is a strange situation because technically you do find that you get uh, the same, well, what's the secant, if this is the point uh, P, what's the secant that connects it to P? It's this one, right? That's not the tangent we want. It's clear that the tangent here is going to be something like this, right? So if you remove the point, it's going to screw everything up. You're going to get like this up and down line. Right, so you, you don't get derivatives at removable singularities. But generally speaking, you don't get a derivative if the function doesn't uh, have that point in its domain. OK, so there, those are the two easy ones. Uh, there are three more instances where we don't get derivatives. Cusp, cusp yes. How can you define a cusp? So is that a cusp? Yeah. It's not. <laughs> so let's start with that one. That's actually called a corner. OK, so you, you don't get derivatives at corners. And it doesn't even have to be a straight corner. One of them can be like this. And then the other guy can be like this. The point is, one of the tangents will always be like that. And something else will be off. So this is called a corner. And you don't get derivatives at corners. Does anyone know what a cusp is? Yes, miss. Oh, um, do you have a question, Miss? Sure. Like this? Oh, sine one over x. No, that does have a derivative, actually, because all you need is um, this is going to be hard for me to say in a meaningful way. The, uh, Derivatives are sort of explaining something about localized behavior. And locally on that messed up curve that you're talking about, things are generally OK. But the sort of global behavior is, is, is screwed up. Um, yeah, so yeah, everywhere on this curve you do, OK, so consider this, OK? Here's sine of x, OK? I could pick any point, and clearly you get some type of tangent there. So the curve you're describing is one where I take this curve and sort of compress it. So imagine then I compress this. That tangent stays with me if I start compressing this. So basically take that messed up curve you're thinking about, stretch it out, draw the tangent, recompress it, and it's, and it's there. That, that's how you could sort of suss that out. But that, not a bad guess, not a bad guess. Um, well, where else do derivatives not exist? We have like not existing derivatives, we have infinite derivatives. Yes, sir. Vertical tangents. Can you give me an example of a vertical tangent? But the function has to, be, has to exist, right? Because we already talked about no domain. So you can't play tricks like 1 over x. I can't say like an equation, but like I know how it looks like. Can you draw it in the air? Like, go to that and straight up in there. That's correct. Good enough. Something like this. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think some of, you would be able to be, some of you may be able to identify this as a point of inflection. We'll uh, flesh that out a little bit more. 
But uh, let's just look at what happens here, right? So if we uh, take the, so this is kind of a nuance, right? If you're taking tangents from this way, what are you finding the slope is doing if we approach from the right? No, no, no. This is zero. This is a zero slope. And then I start moving up like this. What's happening? My slope is decreasing. Decreasing, 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 decreasing until what happens? What's the slope of this line? This, this line has zero slope. What slope does this line have? Okay, so think about what the slope is codifying, right? It's telling you how many steps up you're allowed to take for every step forward. If I'm, if I'm going straight up, that means for zero steps forward, I can move infinitely high. So what does that indicate about the slope? Huh? It's, it's, it's infinite, right? Because look, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That doesn't mean the number is getting tiny. It means the number is going all the way to negative infinity, right? So you could have huge small numbers if you put a negative in front of it. You shouldn't imagine a small number as something like 100, right? Negative 8,000 is an extremely small number, right? So look, the slope is doing this. Uh, smaller, uh, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but larger in magnitude until you get a minus infinite slope from this end. Okay, that in itself wouldn't be bad, right? Because the limit definition would allow me to say something has an infinite slope. That's technically not in violation of what the limits are doing. Limits are undefined when the left limit and the right limit are, uh, don't match. So let's investigate what's happening on this from the other side. So you start off at zero, and then I approach this point. What's happening to the, it's hard for me to reach. I'm tempted to get a chair, but that's just gonna end in me falling on the ground. Okay, so you get, you get zero, and then what's, what's this line? have. Yeah, it's approaching positive infinity. Is that correct? Now that should be a negative slope. Well, in any case, from both ends you're discovering that the tangent line is this. What's the problem now? What is this line? Well, it's just y equals something, right? Is this a function? The up and down line? What's a function? No, it's not because it doesn't function. Yeah, well, let's walk through it as a class. Right? What's, what's a function? A mapping that satisfies the vertical line test. Does the vertical line satisfy the vertical line test? No, it violates the vertical line test an infinite number of times. Right? So we usually say that things that aren't functions aren't allowed to exist in calculus. So we say here that the limit does not exist. Uh, and this is called a, what was it called? Vertical tangent, yes. So this means the left and right uh, limits both give you either positive or negative infinity. The last one, the cusp, is the uh, situation where the left and right limits are both infinite and in addition to being both infinite are different. Right? So you can have something that looks like this. So this is what we call a cusp. Right? These sort of sharp points that come after curves. So what do we get if we move the tangent here? Well, Get a zero tangent, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So from the left hand side, if we're moving this way, we find that the slope is equal to, or maybe more appropriately, if this is f, we find that f prime of zero from the right is positive infinity, right? We're moving upwards. And if we go from the left to zero, we're finding that the slope is decreasing to negative infinity. So as we move from this way, we're finding that f prime of zero from the left is equal to minus infinity, right? So in that case, we say that the derivative doesn't exist because again, the vertical line doesn't satisfy the uh, conditions to be a function. And moreover, these limits aren't the same, right? So it doesn't even satisfy the um, conditions for a limit existing. So this one is just called the cusp. So how is it different than the vertical tangent? The vertical tangent has the same infinite line on both sides, right? And this is also smooth, right? I didn't have to introduce some type of corner. <coughs> like these will occur naturally on cubics. These we sort of have to fake. You only really get cusps or corners when you're throwing in absolute values. Normally, it's the case that things are smooth. So on the vertical tangent, where do you see the positive infinity, infinity and how is it going to negative infinity? No, no, no. I, 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 that was my mistake. From both sides, you're getting to negative infinity. Right? Okay, so since 
since the limit is approaching the same value. Yeah, so technically then the limit would exist and go to infinity. Okay. But when we're working with functions, they have to satisfy the vertical line test. Right? So I can't report that this has a tangent line, which is a function. So right? Because it it's up and down. Line, but it's not that. It's no, it has no tangent line. Well, this is a nuance. It technically has a tangent line, but that tangent line isn't a function. So in that case, we would say the tangent doesn't exist. Is a tangent line by definition a function? A line by definition is a function. Okay. Yeah, has to be a function. So the up and down line is a line despite not being a function. Yeah. OK, so let me give you maybe an exercise to work on. For how much time do we got left? Oh, 35 minutes, so tons of time. Do you guys want to ask me questions about like homework instead? Like we got 35 minutes, we can use this as like a, uh, uh, a class for, like a, basically an open tutorial. Yeah. So I have a question. So yeah. um, for the, um, the solutions for the handouts, mm -hmm. you can post. So if you go to Piazza, which is like the class uh, messaging board, um, there's like a bunch of places where we dumped in where we like basically wrote the statement of the worksheet and said, um, you guys should start collecting your answers. Now, once you guys start putting answers, I'll go in and edit them a bit. I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you guys get the solutions to full. I'm just hesitant to give them to you. Okay. I really, really want you to try. Right, but um, if we, uh, when's the test? Next Tuesday? Yeah. Work on it a bit. So, so by this Friday, we can say we have everything done. Right, I'd like for you to guys to, to like, go and do anything, literally a couple lines, get it started and you'll see. The, the, the work, the, that board is working out pretty good, right? People are getting responses to questions in like 10 minutes. So it is, it's, it is the best way to get help with your homework if you need it. Pe people have been using it. And writing, helping other people understand what um, they're having trouble with is actually an excellent way of um, studying. Explaining something to someone else is a very, very effective way of studying, <coughs> right? Because you have to know what you know before you can explain it. So anyways, here's the uh, exercise. And then I'll just uh, take some questions from the floor. So I want you to investigate um, this function. And I want you to find f prime at 0. OK, so don't forget um, to visualize these things first. Always run to Desmos and try to find anything that you can. Okay, so. I'm going to open questions up to the floor. Is there anything you'd like me to go over again? Is there any thing I explained poorly or you'd want sort of more detail about? So you know the, those, the rest of those examples are online. So you should definitely go and at least read them. OK. Well, basically, all we want you to do, so if something is, um, so f is continuous at uh, x when what? Right, so the only way that you can be able to solve these problems is by knowing the definition. Otherwise, you really got no hope. Yeah, yeah. There are. Those are polynomials, for example, are continuous everywhere. Yeah. But I'm asking you a more specific question. I'm not even asking you to tell me what it means to be continuous everywhere. What does it mean to be continuous at P? Single point. Uh, okay, so you're saying this, uh, f is continuous at p when, and your guess was p in the domain of f, correct? That's your guess? Yeah. So if I can show you a function which, can anyone give me a counterexample to this then? Can anyone give me an example of a function which isn't continuous, which has that p in its domain? Is that continuous? Oh, sorry. 
Is it defined? I know we're going to work out. To, we're going to work to them, right? I'm just showing you that we like if you think you can get there, okay? So it, that's clearly not enough, right? Because I've given you a definition of a function, which is defined at p, but is clearly not continuous. Okay, so we need more. What else do we need? What limit? That's, you're getting there, that's correct. Not only do we want this to exist, we want this to be the ultimate point of the limit from both sides. Okay, so this is my answer to you. In order to solve a question about continuity, you need to know the definition of continuity. So if we're saying show that this violates it, like you, you could detect that this was uh, discontinuous, yeah? If I ask you why, how would you answer? Well, for this specific yeah. Exactly, but do you see that you needed the definition? You said, this isn't continuous because according to the definition that you gave me, this doesn't satisfy that, that condition. So this, there's not really much thinking here, right? Would you give us like a function or would you give us a graph like Does it matter? Which one would you prefer? A graph. Of course. Yeah. But like, like, so would you expect us, like, if we had a function, my question is that if we had a function, how would we solve this? That's one way of determining if it's continuous. No, if, if I really say demonstrate that this is discontinuous, you have to use the limits. Or the, like limit has to appear in your answer somehow. Yeah. Right? So maybe you don't have to do a strict calculation. But I would be looking, okay, so if I said TAs, you're going to mark these tests. I asked one question about continuity. I just want you to, like, if the student says the left and right uh, limits uh, are different, or because like the other way that's not continuous is this, right? So in this condition, I'd say the students need to say that despite the limit existing, the function isn't defined. And that excludes it from the definition. And for this one, you would have to say something like, well, the function is defined, but the left and right limits are different, and therefore the limit doesn't exist, and therefore is disqualified from satisfying the definition. Sorry, yes, miss? We can just write that. Yeah, that's fine. Exactly what you just said. Uh, sure, yeah. Like, we're just trying to, if you say something which is like, yeah, that's sensible, right? I'm not really, like, I'm just more worried about you writing stuff that doesn't make any sense, right? So just try to be careful with what you write. Like, read it, and it should be, you should be able to, like, when practicing, you need to hand off your solution to, your, to a friend and say, friend, read this. I'm not going to help you. Does it make any sense? And maybe your friend will say, yep, yeah, this makes perfect sense, or I don't know what's happening because you need to write a little bit more. But uh, if we've given you a definition, you have to remember them. Right? That's, that's why I, I, go, I take care to say this is a definition and underline it, right? So, because we need to be able to communicate with one another, right? Because if I, if I asked you a different question, if I said, show me that this function doesn't have a limit at p, you could answer that, surely. Right? So this is the problem that a lot of uh, undergrads have. I know, so I give a question, and I know that most people can solve something else, but the thing that's, I know everyone can solve an equivalent thing. So everyone has the capacity to solve the questions we're, we're asking. The, the skill that you need is to find what easy question it is that we're asking. The, the answers will never be very difficult, but maybe the question requires a little bit of, you have to think about what we're really asking. And the thing that we're really asking for is usually easy. Do the practice midterm. That's going to be excellent preparation for the, for the midterm. So I tried to give you some true-false questions that should like boost your confidence a bit. The fill-in-the-blank should boost your confidence a bit. And yeah, it's, it's a fairly standard midterm. You can expect to see. Um, so there's a schedule that we uploaded that have like learning. Like um, in every class, we have an expected number of things that you guys should be able to do, right? Not like understand, like actual, you should be able to shift a sine curve and contract and expand it. That should be on Quirkus. Yes, miss? Um, can you give us more examples? Of? 
Oh yeah, but I, I assigned like 30 Weeby work questions. Well, do you, I could give you an arbitrary amount of work to do, but. No, I mean like just like right now, I'm serious. Wait, okay, can we do one? Yeah. If it's two. Well, did you guys do this one yet? Yeah. yeah. What did you answer? Zero. No. Plot it first. What did the plot show you? Don't you take the derivative and then call it zero? Plot, plot it. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you the answer, but plot it. Do you have a question, sir? No. Okay, I'm gonna um, turn off the. So if there's no more content questions, I'll turn off the video, and then we can just. So there's a worksheet for today. Uh, you can. It's on the Piazza and on Quercus.